Welcome back to the Cross Board Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary's Ward 9 City Council candidate, Kimberly Fazer. Kim, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, Kim, I start off all my interviews with the same question. You're no exception. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? I think my sense of duty just comes from that I love this community and I want to help everyone achieve the best of what they can within the city. Um, I like helping others. I like volunteering with different sports groups, different the school levels. And now I just want to serve our city by being respectful, by being um, present and just showing that I can be a leader who will listen to the general population without coming across as that I know best. So, so where do you get that duty to serve from? Is it from your parents? Do you, are you sort of the oddball out going into politics in your family? Or how did, how did your, how did politics come to be in your, in your life? So politics was always discussed in my family. Um, we had great debates. Um, my dad died about 12 years ago and him and I would get into these great big debates, which I absolutely miss. And, you know, we'd get right worked up and then everyone would start laughing, right? Because you can be very passionate and you can stand on your ideas, but we all still need to respect each other no matter how that came about. I am the oddball in my family. I'm the first person that... Um, like first person running for office. I'm very much supported by my family. None of them live in this city. They're all in Northern Alberta, which I've been very open that I'm a born and raised Albertan, but Northern Alberta. So, but, um, but yeah. fam so family, like uh, it was discussed at the uh, family dinner table each night politics, because when you're talking to people, duty to serve can come in many ways, but you chose politics. You chose to give back in a political way. And I just want to know why now, why, why now, why, what is it at this moment in time that you thought, you know what, my duty to serve is more pressing now than it's ever been to give back to my community because of what we're going through or because of what you've seen? It's kind of a combination of both. I've been seeing a lot of um, disrespect within the city council to each other. We're seeing disrespect happening when they're talking to their ward citizens. We're seeing um, that there is definitely a disconnect of how the city of Calgary residents are feeling to what the council is um, portraying at city hall. So I think it's time for just new people in city hall, some fresh ideas. And I thought now's the time right we're at that precipice of major change needing to happen to keep our young people here in the city to keep our city vibrant moving into new sectors i'm not saying that oil and gas is dead by no means is it dead but we need more we need to be looking at the tech industries we need to be looking at driving in new business and not driving out the business we currently have and now you announced earlier this year that you're running for ward nine Yes. I'm assuming uh, you're a candidate, and if you're not doing this, it'd be very uh, ironic, but you're talking to the citizens of Ward 9. You're talking to the people yes. of Ward 9, and you're hearing their concerns. Are the concerns that you're hearing, are the issues that they're bringing up to you, the issues that you just mentioned, or are you finding issues that you haven't even thought of that you thought, maybe we need to think about this, maybe we need to think about that? So what are you actually hearing from the people of Ward 9? A lot of people in Ward 9 that I have talked to, they're concerned about, again, what I just said, that they're not being listened to, that their ideas are coming forward. And instead of having a dialogue of back and forth, it's a lot of yelling, a lot of, um, I told you this, and this is how it's going to be. So there's that disconnect discontent that we're seeing, but we're also hearing about how people feel how taxes are going. They're... Um, feeling that the money going in isn't being properly spent. So those are kind of the two main issues I've heard. Which, uh, which I'm glad you brought up because uh, on your website, KimberlyFazer.ca, which will be linked in the show notes, uh, there's three areas that I want to talk about dear, for, with you because the three areas that you, you talk about in your opening campaign launch and they're on your website, accountability, fiscal responsibility, and community. So we'll talk about community here first. On your website, you have pledged that if elected on October 18th, you will hold monthly meetings with the communities in and around Ward 9. What does that look like to you? And how do you envision that helping you as a better candidate and as a better counselor 
into the future as we start to recover from this pandemic, recover from the global economic downturn? How does that communication help you in the future as a, the next counselor? Well, that communication really helps you by making sure you stay connected, that you're actually listening to what your ward residents are needing, that you're working towards the same goals. Not everything that the community comes forward with you can achieve, right? But you can at least have that dialogue so that it gets to the point where they, the community can understand why it can't happen. Or maybe as a counselor, I get a better understanding of how we need to make this happen, right? What do I need to change at City Hall in order to have this happen, um, right? Just that open dialogue so that we fully understand where the both are coming from. Because sometimes there's that breakdown. There's some really great um, community associations who are doing really well. And then there's community associations with Ward 9 that really don't have that strong sense of community. And we have to help not that they don't have a strong sense of community, but they don't have an active community, so to speak, right? So you have to um, dive into those communities a little bit different than what we're seeing. Some of that entails um, that I want to have maybe a quarterly meeting with the president. So the presidents all start meeting each other so that they can have an open dialogue of working towards the same goals within Ward 9. Because I find that um, sometimes from the people I've talked to is that they feel like this side of Deerfoot is one way, this side of Deerfoot is treated another. So we need to kind of come together and have a better understanding of where the ward needs to go, how everyone's feeling. And then um, that just helps with ward nine feeling more cohesive. Um, when I say that I wanna hold monthly meetings or attend the monthly meetings, I'm gonna be unable to attend obviously every single meeting, but I'm definitely going to try to either have my office staff attending so that we hear what is going on and I will attend at least one and float throughout that year so that I go to at least each one so that I hear. And then of course the president meetings. So I, I don't think I need to tell you and I've asked this to every candidate who I've had on. If you were elected on October 18th, you were elected by the people of Ward 9, but you were there to serve the people of Calgary. You are yes. not just there to serve the people of Ward 9. You are there to represent them, but you need to look out for the better interest of all of Calgary. So how do you envision yourself working with your community organizations your, in your community, but also looking at Calgary as a whole? Because sometimes wards might have to be left out at budgetary issues because something needs to be done in Ward 12 or Ward 13 or Ward 8. And Ward 9 might not get the budget issue, budget uh, items that they want. So how are you going to ensure that A, the betterment of the city is done, but also looking after your Ward 9 residents? So part of that is, like I said before, those meetings. Those meetings come down to me being able to say, look, this is a part of, let's say, Ward 10 is in desperate need of having this. They have advocated for this. And this is how we will be able to um, use these resources as well and just help connecting that. Yes, Ward 9, I'm representing, but as a whole, the city works together to embedder the whole city um, and really working with um, the councillors who are on the opposite side of Deerfoot so that we get that cohesive feeling that they're not being left out, that they're not, so that if something does come up, say Ward 10 needs something, it's really that they see that it's for the betterment of the whole area, right? So that they don't, Ward 9 doesn't feel like I ignored them or that they're not being listened to. Again, those quarterly, monthly meetings is for me to be able to come forward and say, hey, we found a land that would be better suited over here where um, we were able to raise more money, this kind of stuff, to have it here. It's that open dialogue. As soon as you have the open dialogue, you can work within the wards to help each other to better the city. So it's, it's really just that open dialogue and having the idea that we're here to work together as opposed to always fighting each other because there's a lot of in-house fighting. And, and I agree with that. When I talk to my neighbors and I'm in Ward 10, you mentioned Ward 10 and we're without a counselor right now. So we need a lot of things going on right now. Technically, um, you're kind of covered by Chahal and, sorry, George. Councillor Chahal and Councillor Karak currently, right? Yes, uh, yes. I, I don't know if that's necessarily working well, but it's what you have, right? So Exactly. Um, so 
I, I've got to ask the question because you talk about uh, spending and it is one of the areas that you're talking about here is fiscal responsibility. Yes. A counselor has to learn how to say no very quickly because <laughs> everyone wants something. Yeah. How do you envision yourself working with community groups who are so diverse in your writing, which you've mentioned on your website, you have a diverse uh, community communities within Ward 9. How do you envision working with them? And yet again, going back to that communications, but also outside of that communication to say, while we would love to help you, we just don't have the money because we are in recovering from two pandemics, uh, one pandemic and one economic recovery. How do you how do you envision working with your community groups when we are so strapped for cash right now? So we are super strapped for cash. Um, obviously, as I talk about fiscal responsibility and that we have to account for every dollar spent. So that is going exactly where we need to go. Some of that concentration really does need to be that we are concentrating on the um, social issues that require not require but are needed to ensure that our communities are still growing so to me that is very important that will be something i advocate for to make sure that our communities do have the support they need now when it comes to that we need to have funding for something and we can't have it honesty is your best policy telling a group that oh i'll look into it won't do you a lot of good if at the end of it, you still don't tell them anything and the budget comes out and they're like, well, where's the money? You said you'd look for it. You have to be honest. You have to tell where it's sitting. Um, you have to be honest to say that, look, this might be a five-year plan. We'll have to start doing fundraising. We'll have to, and be willing to help the associations to say, okay, well, I'll show up to this um, fundraiser and I'll do this for you guys so that they know that as the counselor, um, that has been elected to work for them, I will work for you and I'll help you in whatever ways I can. It won't always be that I can give you municipal dollars to help. But again, honesty is key. And, and, and I, I like that because uh, it, it transitions into my literally the next po uh, area that I want to talk <laughs> about is stopping the, the tax tax and spend. We're going to increase taxes. We're going to spend more money because we have more money coming in. You, you were honest on your website that you want to stop that. How do you envision stopping that when, and I, and I think I can say this, and I, I think I said this to everyone, but inflation happens. Cost yes. of doing business does happen. So if you stop increases, you are going to have to cut services, have to look at potentially cutting out some areas that residents rely on. So how do you envision stopping that tax increase while keeping up with inflation? Like, so tax increase that we talk about doesn't always reflect in the city um, inflation, right? So sometimes the tax increases that are happening is just because they've put in new programs that um, they've hired more people. Um, we have our wage increases, that stuff. And I'm not saying that we're looking at cutting jobs or that stuff. Okay. But I do believe that maybe we have to look at, okay, so for this year, we have to do a, um, a wage freeze so that we can fully understand it. And again, that's not an easy thing to say and do, especially when you have the unions and the unions, you have to be, again, transparent, you have to work with them. And they're there for a reason. They're there to protect the workers. So I'm not saying that I'm attacking the union and they're these bad groups. I worked for a union when I worked healthcare. They're, they have their positives, they have their minuses. Let's look at the positive. And if you're willing to work with the groups and say, this is what we need to do, we need to first, first and foremost, we can't say, look, I'm, I'm going to stop the tax increases before we do a proper audit. And I say an audit being that we need to bring in a third party person. We need to look at what the city auditors have said. We need to compare the reports and then just kind of line by line figure out, okay, where can we start cutting back? Is there departments we can merge? Is there redundancy happening within different departments so that um, we can merge it? Then we can disperse the workers to where they kind of need to go, that kind of stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're like going to 
hacks on everything, burnt. Yeah. right? Like, I, I think that there's this uh, mentality that as soon as you say fiscal conservatism or um, accountability, that we're just cutting programs left and right, those programs are necessary. What we need to do is see, are we overspending somewhere that we don't need to be? Are we buying new computers for a department that got computers two years ago, but yet there's a department who last time had computers changed out 10 years ago. We need to kind of look at that so that um, it's just efficiencies, right? And there's efficiencies to be found. There always is. Um, that's a, that's a efficiencies that's, within my own household that I can find. <laughs> and that's a big challenge because the first thing, and I've talked to municipal councillors from across Alberta and, and Ontario and uh, the uh, country, but the first thing the next municipal uh, council will have to deal with is the budget. budget. Yeah. So and you, like very quickly. And yes. unfortunately, there isn't a lot you can do in that first budget. It's what's been left behind for you. And then you have to pick up the pieces from there. So it's not going to be something I can, or we as a new council can fix overnight, but it's going to take some time and it's going to take some really heavy looking into what is happening where. It's going to have to be that we have to make those tough choices and we have to be willing to say, no, this has to stop here. We can't continue with this. Um, some of it might even be that we look at contracting out certain things because um, the contracting it out will be a better spend of our money, right? So we just kind of have to look at that. And I don't mean that um, we get rid of every single like snowplow, right? I think that, let's just put snowplow into it, that, um, Calgary increased their budget this year, but they were one of the lowest um, municipalities with funding towards snow removal, right? So we were significantly lower than even Edmonton by almost half the budget, right? So Calgary is a large city. Maybe we just say, look, we are spending our money on the major thoroughfares. We're going to make sure those get done. And then we contract out everything else, right? So that those snow plows that we do have Let's keep using them, but let's use it in a better way so that we're concentrating on level one um, roads and then the level um, two and three, maybe are contracted out. That way, Calgary is getting the services that we require. One of the big things that is happening right now as we speak, and we are hopefully coming out of this with vaccines getting into the arms of people is COVID-19. COVID-19 has changed the game for municipal politics when it comes to budgetary issues, when it comes to looking towards the future. How do you envision working with the next council as the councillor for Ward 9 to ensure that nobody gets left behind? Because fiscal responsibility is great. It's perfect. In a perfect world, it'd be awesome, but we still have to worry about people who are going to be struggling. Yes, yes. a forensic audit is going to take some time, so we're going to have to deal with that. But how do we ensure that people of Ward 9 and people of Calgary do not get left behind because of this pandemic? So I think the pandemic has changed things for years to come. I think it's going to change how our daily lives have even, because um, it's been a year and a half, right, of our daily lives being truly impacted. And we, it took some time to do the shift. But now that we're in that shift, um, we need to accept that certain things have changed. But right down to right now, people are being left behind. I drove past a food bank area, not in Ward 9. I was up by um, the West Hills area. Um, Anyway, I drove by and the food bank um, church thing said that we'll reopen in September for your, your food needs, which is grateful that the church has done this, but on the flip side, great, you closed it, but these people still need their food. So where are they now going to get food? So we need to make sure that those kind of programs that are obviously volunteer ran are not getting funding from anywhere else, that we figure out how to keep them going. Is it that your volunteers are just burnt right out and maybe we can like get a new pool of volunteers by finding it elsewhere? Those are the things that as a counselor, we can work with the city groups to keep developing, right? It comes down to affordable housing. I find that that sometimes is just the key word. If I say I'm gonna work on affordable housing, people are just like, oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. But you need an idea behind it. It needs yeah. to be a little bit more than just, well, you know, 
we, um, what was it? I was reading an article that was talking about how far behind Calgary is for affordable housing. And we need to add about 200 units a year to get ourselves even to be where we become at like the halfway point for the next like 10 years. Um, don't quote me on those 100%. Those are just I can't but, remember. But, exactly. but we are we, we are far, falling behind when it comes to that. Yeah. I will be the first to admit that when I, I'm relatively new, I've moved from Northern Alberta as well. And uh, I, I was shocked by the lack of affordable housing that is in uh, Calgary. And I will be honest, I like I've never looked into it, but it is one that I've gone, OK, we should be doing a lot more. Yeah, no, there is a lot more we can do. And some of it I know this is kind of a wild idea out there. It doesn't necessarily need to be that we build these units that are just for the low income, this stuff. Why can't we look at these great big towers that Calgary is pushing right now? Like some of it in Inglewood, the 12 story buildings that the Inglewood residents are like, look, it changes the look of our um, area, that kind of stuff, um, which I agree with and I understand and they don't feel like they're being listened to. Um, but in some areas where they've decided they're going to put these 12 story buildings and they're going to be these extremely, you know, nice places, somewhat expensive, why can't we take 20 or 10% of each floor and use it towards affordable housing so that those are discounted rates that is right in that apartment complex, everyone else pays the same amount, but then instead of you being pointed out that, oh, they live in low income housing, no one really knows right? You're yeah. living in this tower. Why can't we give them that sense of I belong? And it doesn't necessarily have to be I belong in this, right? Like not saying that affordable housing is a bad thing. It is absolutely needed. But maybe we need to shift how we go about looking at it. And if we're going to make these great big towers, how do we include that in that? And that's a, I think a conversation that hasn't happened yet needs to happen to work, work us towards that. One area that I want to talk about before we move on to the next uh, segment, and I would not be a true uh, host without asking the million dollar question that is burning a hole within Calgary Council these days, the green line. The green line yes. will be going through part of Ward 9. Uh, we are seeing changes after changes and we're seeing the provincial government getting involved we're seeing them say we need to do some business studies on the northern part but the southern part we can go ahead with as the, as a fiscal uh, conservative who wants to look at the way we do taxing and spending within the city hall how do we ensure that this does not this project does not overrun its budget that we've potentially set out because that is the one thing with municipal politics and I, I worked in municipal politics so I know a budget is not a budget a budget is a shot in the dark of what it's going to come in at and then there's going to be a budget afterwards of a few extra million dollars so as a fiscal conservative who who wants to potentially audit the finances how do we ensure this project does not go over uh board well the thing about the uh, green line is that first of all we need it right? Yeah. We do need that connector. No one's saying we don't need it. What we're saying is how it's going about, how they've chosen the routes that they're going. Um, there is a man named Jim Gray, who's put out an excellent report where he spent his own money and some other people have come forward to spend their money to look into more viable routes that we can, can do. Um, I know he's presented it at city council. It didn't, they didn't really like his ideas, but it moved away from the tunnel that they're doing, right? Because the tunnel, where it's going, um, first of all, they have to bring in European people to come in and nothing against Europeans. I, I don't mean that bad technology because we don't have it to make this tunnel so that uh, we don't worry about flooding, that kind of stuff. But on the flip side, we do need to worry about the flooding and how are we making sure that when the Bow River does flood and the Bow and the Elbow, they flood. Well, how are we protecting that infrastructure? How often are we gonna to have to worry that we have to redo this tunnel or um, save the tunnel from flooding? And that hasn't really been discussed. It hasn't been properly looked at. Um, there are viable routes that take you away from doing that tunnel and kind of more skirts that. Um, I find that his study very intriguing. I, I need to learn more about it. He did send it to us um, part portions of it. Um, 
and it's so just you're, an you're in favor of the green line as yeah. going through your ward nine the southern part of it it's just that one section and i think that is the biggest contention from all council is that one section correct yeah yeah the other contention is is that a lot of the people in that i've talked to in the ward um they're concerned that there's no parking at it. They're concerned that we have to get on the bus to get there to ride this and it's not going anywhere yet. And when you're looking at a budget of $5.5 billion um, and that's just that small little portion that um, is the new cars, it's all that because it's uh, lower, it's more accessible for riders, which is wonderful that they've actually considered all of that. Not everyone is, capable of um, walking the stairs or making the big um, changes. So I think that's a wonderful thing that they're working towards. But um, those budgets, as soon as you spend a billion dollars, there is like actual studies that have been done by engineering groups to say that it's like a 20% add-on. So you're looking at a $5.5 billion that at every billion, we're having a 20% overage. That will bankrupt the city. So we have to look at it. We have to um, fully figure out, is this the right time to do it? Yes, we need it. Yes, at some point this project has to start and we need to stop it, it stops. And yes, there's federal funding. Yes, there's provincial funding. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good project to do because that's left on the taxpayers and there's only one taxpayer, right? I mean, we yeah. can't bankrupt the city and think, oh, we'll eventually figure it out with taxes. We have to look at the whole thing and I'm grateful that they, the provincial government and Minister McIver is looking at the whole thing, which is ironic because Mr. Um, Minister McIver um, and um, MLA Joe CC, when they were on the Calgary um, Council, they brought this forward at the time, right? They were pushing for it back in 1995 and we're now sitting at 2021 and we still don't have a green line like it's just astounding how long it takes for us to get to the point of let's get this done when really it shouldn't be taking this long to get the green line infrastructure and they've had that funding sitting for them for a very long time so that's the other things that we need to start looking at well, why is it taking the city of Calgary this long to get anything done right Exactly. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm conscious, cautious of time here, and I just want to make sure I Sorry. get into this part Sorry. because no, no, it's great because I love conversations like this because I could talk about policy for like an hour and a half, two hours. But uh, the last area I want to talk about before we start doing our wrap up here is accountability. Yes. Um, I talk to my neighbors, I talk to people in Ward 9 who I, I, I know, and I have people from across the city. And you have hit the hammer on the nail here when you said, the name calling has to stop. The petty politics has to stop at City Hall. How do you envision being accountable to the people of Calgary and Ward 9 while ensuring that council runs smoothly? How, like, because everyone is a diverse person in that council uh, yep. hall and there's different opinions and sometimes opinions do get heated. So how do you envision a more cohesive council with you on it? So more co for me, I think that, okay, so we've had the heated debate. As long as we don't name call or send um, nasty tweets afterwards, right? Because we've seen that as well. We've seen that past council, it goes out onto social media. We need to say to each other as we come forward that, look, we might not agree, but we need to show each other respect and we need to be able to go out onto our social medias and show the city of Calgary that we are working together. Even though we might not agree on everything that we see you do here, um, that we respect each other. And a part of that respect is not going out to the social medias and um, name calling some more that we have to do that whole um, public apology and still waiting for some public apologies to come forward, right? Um, that's but, where we really started, right? But but isn't that politics though? Isn't that politics? Because we we are, we are we we are currently in a campaign. And you're seeing that more hyperactive politics that you're that name calling that hey you're doing this wrong and I'm doing this wrong because people are running for mayor and council candidates are yep. being who they are. I haven't Saying seen it from that yourself. You've done something wrong is different than yeah. actually continuing the name calling and justifying why you call them a certain certain name, right? Like, True. 
I don't mean to throw any counselor under the bus, but look at counsel, counselor Woolley. He was actually told that he had to do a public apology because what happened inside the council continued afterwards on his social media. He did a kind of apology, but I don't think it was a true heartfelt look I did wrong. Um, and it shouldn't have had to come that the watchdog comes in and says, you can't do that. That should be yeah. you saying, hey, I did this wrong and I apologize. You do the public apology so that the city hears that, hey, I 100% know I did this wrong. Even right down to Councillor Maglioka. Um, you know, if I work with these people, great. Obviously, Councillor Woolley is uh, leaving, but let's say Councillor Maglioka um, continues. I don't need, I want to work with them and we'll figure it out. But when you were called out for improper expenses, you haven't come out and done a proper apology and said, I said, look, I did wrong and I need to fix this. We're still waiting for that. That hasn't transpired, which leaves people with a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah, we're going to fight. Yeah, we're going to disagree. But it's taking account, like steps that are accountable to say, I did this wrong and I am sorry, right? It's just being the humble, true person that we you, you were elected to be, right? Yeah, we're, gonna, we're all A-type personalities. We're all passionate about the politics we believe in, our policies. But there's a level of respect that we need to show, right? We need to stop with the divisiveness. We need to put that aside and work to, for the best of what Calgary can be and leave Calgary as the best it can be. One other area I want to talk about, because this is the area that I I, I always, I, I chuckle when I read it on any candidate's uh, uh, website, but I, I'm going to ask you why you said this. You have committed to a two-term councilship. So two terms, that's all you'll do because of new ideas. I, I've heard councillors say that from time to time and say, oh, I'll only go two terms and I'll walk away. But sometimes... It's, it's a good job that you just want to keep on doing. How do you ensure that only two terms and you're out? How do you ensure two terms in 20, I'm just doing the basic math here, 2028 would be the last of your term, you would walk away from councillor as Ward 9? So I think that we can put in a policy that actually states that, right? So you can go as a counselor for two terms and then go be your mayor for two terms. It's just that I think that once you've had more than your two terms, you kind of get embedded with a certain idea, right? That, um, and we're seeing this with our very long-term counselors, that they know best, right? We don't always know best. You might have the most information in your pocket, but that doesn't mean you know best. And sometimes you just need to take that step back and say, maybe I need to leave for a little while and see the picture from a resident's point of view and make sure that that ensures that, not make sure, but that then ensures that more people have an understanding that we don't get embedded in certain um The more we're in council, you get embedded with the different, um, people who are coming to um, advocate for their own groups, that kind of stuff. And sometimes you don't see everything else. You have the most information, but your you're not talking about changing, right? It, you're not talking exactly. to the residents anymore. So I think that's where that two-term policy that I believe needs to come into play. If you want to be a career politician, that's where provincial and federal politics are. What we like about municipal politics is that you're at home right? When you start thinking about provincial and federal, you have to leap. But sometimes the longer you're in play, um, that's where you will be better is that, well, now I have a better understanding of what's happening on the provincial side. And I can go over to the provincial side now and advocate for the city of Calgary to have this happen, right? Because yeah. we're beginning to see, and we've watched it, you have too, on Twitter, where they're like attacking the provincial government. How do you plan on working with that provincial government afterwards to get the best for the city? Because now the provincial government sitting there being like, well, you've bashed me this whole year on social media. Why would I work with you? And 
we have to change that a little bit, right? That, yeah, you can call out, but you have to watch how you do it, right? Because you still have to have a working relationship. And we're seeing those bridges kind of burn, right? That they're not, it, it truly shows that you have no want to have a working relationship with the provincial government. And how do you ensure afterwards that you pick up those pieces, especially when they haven't been willing to say, look, I, I said something wrong. I apologize without a watchdog coming in, right? So that's where I really feel that those two terms become super important. If there's a really big municipal idea that you think is super important for you to go and advocate for at the provincial level, that's when you go, right? Once you have the understanding of how the municipal is working understandable um one area i want to talk about briefly and i didn't talk about this at the beginning but you mentioned it in your video keeping our community safe um when i first moved to calgary i i i, I do what i'm assuming most other people do you learn about the community that you're going to be moving into you learn see crime rates make sure that it's a safe neighborhood um I relatively, uh, I'm in the Northeast, it's relatively a safe neighborhood, but you see the news reports from CTV, CBC, Global about the crime, the crime that's happening in the Northeast in Ward 9, Ward uh, 5, Ward 10. And you got to think, how do, how do we ensure that we are kept safe, but also at the same time that the negative stereotype of the Northeast being a bad place to live doesn't take hold because it's not a bad place to live. It's a great place to live. Yeah. So a part of that is there's some great community groups working together, the CSI 12, right? The, um, and they're working to change that stigma a little bit and working to keep their community safe because there are certain things that are happening in different areas that um, it moved from being downtown, then it moved into like Inglewood and the Bridgeland, and now it's kind of in Forest Lawn, right? So some of it is going to definitely be that we have to work with um, the federal government on how we change certain things so that when people come into the area looking for certain services that we are keeping the people there safe so how do we go about doing that right that might be that we have to put certain cameras in so that we know who's walked in who's walked out right some of that's going to be that um, as the uh, provincial government announces where the new injection sites are going to be that instead of just worrying about that three block radius that we have to worry about the push out of what the crime ends up being as we saw at um, Sheldon Sch Schumer Center um, that's all that working together but it also ensure um, needs to start looking at that um, the city police um, with the crime going up they need more people right but maybe we need to take a different approach on how we do our mental health calls so that instead of a um and they're already doing these changes so instead of a police officer showing up it's a mental health worker coming but they've been properly trained with police procedure right so that they know how to de-escalate certain situations that they're not walking into an area that is going to um not an area but into a situation that will escalate because they didn't approach it properly. I think that the whole idea of how we're trying to defund, we need to bring in certain groups. We need to bring in those social workers. We need to bring in the mental health workers, be it nurses, be it doctors, but have them trained so that they have the proper police procedure, but they walk in being more of that calm front for the mental health checks and the mental health calls so that it just changes that whole dynamic of how people are feeling about the police and how we approach these issues. And especially as we are having more overdoses, more drug uses, we're seeing um, crime increasing because there's a gang related issue that no one really wants to talk about, but yet you can go and find that in some articles it's talking about it. It's this whole new approach and we can't defund the police as some um, councillors voted for um, without that impacting how the gangs move into our city, right? And where's that gonna come from, right? You defunded, but now where, does that come out of the gang unit or does that come out of how the police have been working the inner city streets to um, build relationships so that, um, where does that come from right because yeah. these relationships that are being built in the inner city to help our homeless 
are just as important as the gang units are, right? And how do we ensure that the detectives who are working on the homicide stuff aren't getting so burnt out that there isn't new people coming in? There's that whole defund police that we have to watch how we word that because certain cities in the United States have moved towards that and they're seeing increased crime. So I think we need to take a new approach to it as opposed to saying defund, let's bring in these groups, properly train them in police work and then have a more functional unit. Right down to, sorry. No, go ahead, continue on. It's okay. I love when people talk because it's an amazing because I'm getting so much insight from you, Kim, and I, I greatly appreciate you even taking the time to do this. But one area before we do wrap up, I want to talk about keeping residents here in Calgary. Yes. On my street alone, and I, I check uh, MLS and realtor.ca all the time, uh, there is a large turnover within the city. People are leaving. People are going back to Ontario. People are leaving because they don't feel safe. The taxes are going up. Um, how do you envision keeping people here and keep retaining the people we have and attracting new people to come to our city? Some of that right down comes down to our tax and spend mentality, right? So that and how we have been taxing our businesses. So we have great opportunity to have like the tech sector come here and we have some great big tech sectors coming to us currently but in order for that to continue to happen is that we need to look at how we're taxing our businesses and taxing our um our personal base so that that keeps people here because currently there's this mentality that we are um only oil and gas that were there's no future for you here in calgary i was I'm reading certain articles that talk about that on the 20 to 24 age group so that they're flooding to toronto because that's where they see this vibrant diverse um the arts programs that kind of stuff so i think in some ways the council once they come into play need to talk to the cities who reinvented themselves because toronto wasn't there 10, 15 years ago, they've moved towards that. So how does Calgary move towards that as well? And again, that comes down to not me saying that I know best and I'm going to tell you what happens. That's us saying, okay, we need to talk to Vancouver because Vancouver has a great program for um, um, affordable housing. And then we need to talk to Toronto and find out how did they start attracting these tech industries? How did you keep, right? Those are the things that our young people are looking for. They have a different way of seeing um, how society moves and that requires council saying, we need to work more with them. We need to connect with the universities and colleges and figure out really where, where do they see our city going and how can I help um, bridge that? And maybe they don't understand that's where our city is moving. How do we bridge that? How do we make sure that they're aware that these things are coming into play and Calgary is renewing itself? Some of it comes down to how our downtown ended up being structured, where in the last decade, they allowed just massive towers and no one really stopped and thought about housing until recently, right? And no one really stopped and thought about where we're going to put restaurants and that kind of stuff. We're beginning to see it, but if you go into the older areas or even from the first decade of the deck, like say 2012, the buildings that were built then, there isn't anything there except for a big tower, right? So yeah. um, some of that was poor planning and now we have to go back in and fix it and how do we how do we go about fixing it so that we draw people into the downtown core how do we we need to stop with the um super expensive parking downtown and this mentality that well people will come anyway well they're not coming and we're driving people out and we have to look at all these different avenues and maybe at six o'clock we drop the parking prices to a quarter of the amount maybe we start saying that instead of having these massive parking structures that the parking structures are underneath or right a little kind of it's a whole new way of thinking that we have to look at and some of it's going to require um big meetings and not just while well, we're looking at revitalizing by putting plants down there but it needs more than just plants, right? So. Yeah, I agree. Um, I am going to ask one last question and then we'll do the wrap up here. 
why should you be the next city councilor for Ward 9? Well, I'm asking to be the next councilor um, because I just feel passionate about the city. I'm an, a, a new voice coming forward. I want people to see that I want to actually represent. I want to work. I want to bridge the gap that we're seeing between the city. I want to make sure that there's an understanding of why money went towards like the Foothills um, Athletic Park or why we're building a new athletic park in Ward 5 and ensure that people understand how they can access these things as opposed to people thinking that, well, we're not doing anything, right? So people don't necessarily always see where they can find their community resources. And the community resources doesn't mean it has to be in your back door. It can be that it is in Ward 5 or it is in at the Foothills Athletic, but how we can access that. And I think as a counselor, I can help achieve that by bridging those gaps and helping people understand the different routes that we can take at City Hall. Perfect. Um, Kim, I have one last uh, promotion idea for you. How can people get involved in your campaign? Uh, well, this comes out in August, so you have two months left in the campaign. How can people get involved and how can people help you become the next or become the next counselor for Ward 9? So you can go to my social media accounts. Um, Twitter's at KA Phaser. You can go to um, my Facebook, which is Kimberly Phaser for Ward 9, um, and my website, KimberlyPhaser.ca. Uh, they all have my phone numbers on it. You can call my um, campaign phone. I will get back to you right away. Send me emails, which is Kimberly.Phaser at gmail.com. Um, I respond to everything as soon as possible. And um, just reach out. I will answer. Um, I can always use more volunteers that we can use people to help with signs, all that fun stuff. So perfect. And for my listeners and to the viewers, uh, the links to Kim's Twitter, Facebook website, and her email will be in the show notes. I highly recommend if you live in the uh, ward nine, check them out, get involved in the campaign, get out and vote on advanced voting date. If not vote on election day, greatly appreciate it, Kim, for doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful.